Two summers back, I had to visit a new town for a job chance. This job could mean a big change for me, so I planned to stay for two days to check out the place, thinking about if I'd like to live there. I didn't put much thought into where I'd stay, just quickly picked a spot on the Airbnb app that looked alright. The owner of the place seemed friendly enough from what I could tell. When I got there, the place was pretty okay. A small house not too far from the center of the city. I took the keys, left my things inside, and then left to explore for a few hours. That evening, I came back and went to bed early, as I usually do. But something odd happened that night. I suddenly woke up, which was strange because I normally sleep through the night. I was confused when I saw it was still dark outside. Checking the time, it was 2.30 a.m. Just as I was wondering why I woke up, I heard the sound of the front door opening. It was dead quiet before that, and the noise scared me a lot. There shouldn't have been anyone else coming in. I wasn't thinking straight, probably because I had just woken up. So I did something very childish. I grabbed my blanket and covered myself with it, hoping somehow that would make me safe. Then I heard footsteps. They were getting closer to where I was sleeping. My heart was beating so fast, and I was really scared. After a moment, I realized how silly it was to think a blanket could protect me. But what could I do in such a short time? The footsteps were almost at the bedroom door now. The best idea I had was to act like I was still sleeping. I thought that if someone was trying to steal from the place, seeing me asleep might make them leave me alone. I felt stuck with no other choice. There wasn't enough time to hide or find something to defend myself with. My phone was too far away to call for help, sitting on the desk charging. Then, the person reached the door. I heard it creak open, so I shut my eyes tight, pretending to be deep in sleep. The footsteps entered the room, and then nothing. They just stopped. Silence hung in the air for what felt like an eternity. I risked a tiny peek, trying hard to keep my eyelids almost closed so it looked like I was still sleeping. Through the narrow slit of my eyes, I saw a figure by the door, staring directly at me. It took me a few seconds to recognize the face. It was the man who owned the Airbnb. His picture had been on the app. There he was, just standing and looking at me without any emotion. I quickly pretended to be asleep again, hoping he hadn't noticed my brief look. My heart was pounding, and I couldn't understand why he was there, just watching me. He stayed like that, motionless, for what seemed like hours, but was probably only a few minutes. Then, I heard him turn and walk away. Lying there, I listened to every sound, tracing his steps back to the door and out of the house. I couldn't sleep again for hours, even long after he had left. The next morning, feeling a mix of fear and anger, I contacted the Airbnb owner to ask why he was in the house at night. He completely denied ever being there. I reported him and never stayed at an Airbnb again after that. That night remained with me, a chilling reminder of the encounter. In my life, I learned that scary folks could be living just a short drive away and you'd have no clue unless you bumped into them somehow. This truth hit home when our place got swarmed with tiny bedbugs. This happened right after my cousin dropped by and we ended up having to clear the house with smoke to kill all the bugs. Because of this, we couldn't step foot in our home for three whole days until it was completely safe again. To make the situation a bit better, my mom and dad chose to rent a nice looking house on Airbnb that was a bit outside our city. It was a big deal for me since I had never left the busy streets of New York City before. So, at 13 years old, I was really excited, but things didn't go as well as I had imagined. As we got to the place, everything looked awesome from the outside. There was a yard surrounded by a fence, a long driveway with a basketball hoop, and even a ball for us to play with. They also had a big light that turned on by itself if we wanted to play outside when it got dark. We all rushed inside to explore the house before settling down. After making ourselves at home, we had some dinner, and then decided to go for a quick walk to see the area around the house before it became too dark. The small neighborhood around the house seemed pretty and peaceful. There were a few other houses on the street, and they all kind of looked the same. The trees along the road were beautiful, and hearing the sound of bugs was something new and surprising for me, so different from the constant noise of the city. But on our walk back, things turned strange. We saw a man standing at the end of his driveway, just staring at our temporary home. 
As we got closer, my dad tried to be friendly, saying hi and explaining we were just renting the place for a few days. But the man didn't say anything back. He just gave my dad, then my mom and me, a long look, turned around and walked away from us. It was one of the oddest moments I've ever had. We rushed inside, locked the door tight, and tried to relax by watching a movie. But after meeting that man, we all felt uneasy. Instead of going to our separate bedrooms, we decided to stick together in the living room for the night. We all managed to fall asleep for a bit, but then I suddenly woke up. A bright light had flashed through the window. It was the motion sensor light outside. Thinking it was probably just an animal, I got up to check, but what I saw wasn't an animal at all, and I screamed so loud that my parents woke up instantly. They saw what I saw, the same man from earlier, standing at the end of the driveway, just staring at the house. My mom grabbed her phone to call the Airbnb owner while my dad yelled at the man from behind the locked door. The man ran off as soon as he saw my dad making noise. When my mom hung up the phone, she told us what the owner had said. The man was just a neighbor who seemed way too interested in the house, showing up at all hours to stare at it. That explanation didn't make us feel any better. We decided we couldn't stay there anymore. So we packed up our things and found a motel to stay in for the rest of our time until our own home was bug-free. The thought of someone lurking around watching the house at night was too much for us to handle. Last year I got an invite to a friend's wedding in a small town in Washington. I wasn't from that area, but I thought it would be a good chance to have a short holiday while I was there. I wanted to see what was around the place, and I found a great deal on an Airbnb not too far from where the wedding was going to be. The wedding was on a Saturday, and I got to the Airbnb on a Thursday afternoon. It was a cozy little house in a quiet neighborhood, and I had it all to myself. On the first day, I visited a town close by and caught up with another friend who was also coming to the wedding. That night, I got back to the house pretty late and felt exhausted. I jumped into bed, turned the TV on, and was asleep in no time. The next morning, I woke up without needing an alarm, which was nice. I made myself some coffee and stepped outside to see the weather because it looked sunny and pleasant. While standing on the front porch, I noticed a piece of paper stuck to the door. Curious, I took it off to read it. The note was chilling. I got into your house last night. Better fix your locks. There was a little winking face drawn on it. Reading this made my heart race, and I quickly went back inside to check the house. I was certain I had locked the front door because I had just unlocked it to go out. The house had another door at the back, so I rushed to see if it was locked, and it was. I began to search every corner of the small house. Given its size, it didn't take long to check every room. After checking all the places someone could hide, like the rooms, closets, and even the small spaces, I found nothing. No one was there, and there were no signs that anyone had been. It scared me, but I started to think maybe someone nearby was playing a trick on me, knowing people often rented this house, but I couldn't be sure. I sleep very heavily, and the house was almost empty, so it's possible someone was inside without me knowing. I left the house soon after to explore more of the city and visit some parks. I took all my important things with me, just to be safe, and I sent a message to the person who rented me the house about the creepy note. I hoped they would get back to me before I returned, to tell me everything was okay and it was just a joke. After spending the day eating at local places, seeing the parks, and checking out interesting buildings, I came back to the house at night. The owner hadn't responded to my message, which made me a bit scared to sleep there. But I was very tired and managed to convince myself it was all just a prank since the house looked exactly as I had left it. The wedding was the next day, so I watched some TV and fell asleep around 11.30 p.m. I woke up the next morning without an alarm, but it was early, just past 6 a.m. I didn't have to get up until 9, and I thought about going back to sleep, but I felt a bit worried. I decided to get up and check the house to make sure everything was still okay. Walking down the hallway from the bedroom, I immediately saw that the back door was wide open. I felt a rush of fear and knew I had to leave right away. I remembered locking that door before bed. I grabbed my things in less than five minutes, ready to leave. But as I reached the front door, I heard the sound of a closet door in the living room starting to open. I didn't look back. I ran to my car and drove off. 
I never saw anyone come out of the house, but I quickly messaged the owner and then Airbnb's customer service. I spent the rest of my trip in a hotel, not wanting to take any more chances. Two years back, I went to a new town because I might get a job there. I was supposed to stay for two days to see if I liked the place for living. I didn't look much for a place to stay. I quickly picked a spot on the Airbnb app that seemed okay. The owner of the place sounded friendly. When I got there, the place was all right. It was a small house close to the city center. I took the keys, went in to leave my bags, and then left to explore for a few hours. I came back later that evening and went to bed early. I usually sleep early and wake up early, so this was normal for me. But that night, I woke up suddenly and it was still dark outside. I checked the time, and it was 2.30 a.m. Just then, I heard the sound of the front door opening. The house was silent until that noise, and it scared me a lot. I was sure I was supposed to be alone in the house. I don't know why, but my first reaction was to hide under my blankets like a child. Soon I could hear someone walking towards where I was sleeping. My heart was beating so fast and I was very scared. I realized hiding wasn't smart, but there was no time to think of anything else. The footsteps kept getting closer, and I was sure they would come into the bedroom. All I could think to do was act like I was still sleeping. Perhaps, I thought, if someone came to steal or something, they might just leave me alone if they saw me sleeping. This felt like my only choice. I couldn't hide in the closet or find something to defend myself with. I couldn't even call for help because my phone was too far away, charging on the desk. Then the person reached the bedroom door. It opened, and I shut my eyes tight pretending to sleep deeply. I heard them step into the room and stop. Silence followed for what felt like a long minute. Very slowly I opened my eyes just a little. I tried to make it look like I was still asleep, but I needed to see who was there. As soon as I looked, I saw someone standing at the door looking right at me. After a few seconds, I realized who it was. It was the man from the Airbnb. I remembered his face from his profile photo. He just stood there, watching me, without any expression. I gently closed my eyes, trying not to show I had been looking. I was scared and confused about why he was there. He didn't move for what seemed like five long minutes. It felt endless, and I was scared of what he might do next. Eventually, I heard him turn and walk away. I stayed awake, listening as he moved through the house, went to the door, and left. I couldn't sleep for hours after that, but thankfully he didn't come back. The next morning, I called the Airbnb owner to ask why he was in the house at night. He completely denied being there. I reported him and decided never to use Airbnb again. That experience ended my trust in it. My name is Anna. I'm in my 40s, and my friend and I have a business using Airbnb in the UK. We have several places in London. While my friend deals with the money, I take care of the everyday tasks like fixing things, answering guests, and checking the places before and after guests stay. Summer and Christmas are very busy for us, but autumn is slow and tough on our profits. Last year, we were very happy to get a booking for three weeks in one of our nice places in North London during autumn. It was a big deal for us because we needed the money and we did everything we could to make the guests happy, hoping they would come back. With Airbnb, we usually don't meet the guests. This was true for these guests, too. We didn't hear from them at all for the three weeks. The booking was made by a girl named Alice. She paid everything up front. Halfway through their stay, I sent Alice a message to check if all was well. She replied, Fine. Thanks. So we thought everything was going great. It's good to have guests who don't need much help because sometimes guests can be a lot of work if they call too much or complain about things that aren't really problems. When the three weeks ended, I went to the apartment to check it. I expected everything to be okay. I was expecting maybe some towels on the floor or a bag of trash left behind. You know, the usual mess when people rush out. Once, we had a guest throw a huge party and left a huge mess, so I was always ready for a big cleanup. But what I found in that apartment that day was beyond anything I had expected. Right away, when I tried to open the door and felt it stuck, I knew something wasn't right. It took some pushing to get inside. Then I saw chairs stacked against the door, like someone was trying to keep something out. 
or maybe in. It was strange and made me feel uneasy. The apartment was also very cold, which was odd. I guessed someone left a window open, which we asked guests not to do because of the pigeons around there. I couldn't understand why someone would block the door and then leave through a window. It made no sense. I was confused, but kept going to close that window. That's when I walked into the living room, following the cold air, and saw the real mess. It wasn't like the mess from a party with bottles and trash everywhere. This looked like a fight happened there. Glasses and plates were broken, chairs missing, tables flipped over. It was chaos, and it made me feel very scared. What had happened in here? The mess was everywhere. Next, I went to the bedroom, leaving the bathroom for last because I was really scared of what I might find there. Seeing how bad the bedroom was made me even more worried. There were empty wrappers and various toys scattered all around. The sheets were dirty with stains that I didn't even want to think about, and the smell was awful. It was a nightmare. I knew I had to check the bathroom next, even though I was expecting the worst. I thought I'd have to clean up a disaster, but nothing could have prepared me for what I found. I slowly pushed the bathroom door open, took a quick look inside, and then slammed the door shut. In the bathtub, there was something that looked like a person. But it wasn't right. It was twisted and covered in blood, more like a pile of meat than a human being. For a moment, I couldn't accept what I saw. I tried to tell myself it was something else, anything but what it really was. I don't know what made me do it, but I had to look again. I really didn't want to look again, but something inside me couldn't accept what I had seen was real. Maybe I was hoping I had imagined the worst, and it wasn't as bad as I thought. But it was worse. There was a body in the bathtub, in the worst state imaginable. At first I didn't realize it was a human because the face was so badly damaged, she didn't look human anymore. Every inch of her was covered in blood, not the dark clotted kind but fresh, as if it had happened only a few hours ago. I immediately grabbed my phone and called 911, telling them I needed the police fast. I assumed the girl in the bathtub was the one who had rented the place. She was so still, not breathing, and I was sure she was gone. I even told the person on the phone I thought she was dead. Then they asked me to check her pulse. I was sure I wouldn't feel anything. How could anyone survive such violence? At first, I couldn't even find the right spot on her neck. In the panic, I couldn't remember her name. I said Alice. And then she opened her eyes. Seeing her suddenly look at me, as if coming back from the dead, was the most terrifying moment of my life. Her eyes were bloodshot, one completely red, with no white left. When she saw me, she screamed and started moving wildly. I ran out of the apartment, shouting into the phone that she was alive. The person on the phone told me to go unlock the front door for the police. I ran to do it, but then had to make sure the girl didn't leave the apartment in her state. When I found her again, she was in the hallway crying. I told her help was on the way. Her tears were washing away the blood, revealing her injured face. The paramedics said she couldn't have run away because her legs were badly hurt. They had to bring a stretcher for her. After she was taken away, the police asked me about the renters. I only knew her name and how long they had stayed. They promised to keep me informed for the insurance claim. A week later, a police officer called me. He explained the two girls were working in London, charging less than the local gangsters liked. The gangsters had planned to scare them, but ended up hurting one girl badly. The police had some suspects, but couldn't share details. That was all I learned about the incident. The police let us know when we could use the apartment again, and I focused on the insurance. This was the worst thing that ever happened with our Airbnb. It was one of the most horrifying experiences of my life. On my 26th birthday, me and my friends decided to rent a simple house by a river we found online. We wanted to enjoy the river and celebrate together. It was a kind thought from them, and I was really thankful. The day was not the best birthday ever, but it's hard to blame them for what happened next. We arrived at the house on a Thursday around 4 in the afternoon, which gave us enough daylight to go swimming before nightfall. Excited, we quickly threw our bags onto the beds and changed to swim. 
We spent about an hour in the water before we decided to dry off, eat some snacks, and light a fire. I had brought my guitar, and we sang songs and had fun until we were all too tired to stay up. Then, it was time to douse the fire and head to bed. We split into two rooms. The beds were not very comfortable, but I was so worn out from the day's activities that I fell asleep easily. I usually sleep very deeply and hardly ever wake up at night. Only if I feel something moving me or touching my face. That night, I felt something tickling my nose, which made me swat it away and turn over, and that's when I heard a low, whispering sound. I couldn't understand it and was too sleepy to care much. Thinking my friends were playing a prank, I told them to stop because I wanted to sleep. But then, I heard the whisper again. This time, I sat up quickly and turned around, ready to scold my friends. But to my shock, nobody was there. And my friend Jake, who was sleeping in the same room, didn't even stir. I thought maybe a bug had landed on my face, so I decided to try and sleep again. As I was about to drift off, that strange noise came back. It sounded like soft talking or someone laughing under their breath. But this time, it seemed to come from the end of my bed. I had enough of these tricks. I jumped out of bed, ready to catch whoever was pranking me. But once more, there was no one there. When I turned to look at the bed, I finally saw what made the noise. It wasn't someone talking. It was a snake, quietly hissing at the edge of my bed. I screamed and woke Jake up, who also freaked out when he saw it. We quickly woke up the others to search the whole house for any more surprises, wondering how we'd deal with the snake on my bed. We couldn't tell if it was dangerous or not. After some panic, we managed to get the snake into a pillowcase and carried it outside, releasing it back into the wild. I couldn't close my eyes for the rest of our stay, haunted by the thought of a snake near my face while I slept. That birthday was memorable for all the wrong reasons. In 2022, I took a solo trip to Italy for a whole week. I was checking out several hotels for my stay, but then I found out that I could rent a whole apartment on Airbnb for the same cost. And these places were incredible. For what you'd usually pay for a fancy hotel room, I could stay in an apartment that looked like something out of a rich person's dream vacation, similar to those you'd find in places visited by the wealthy. Italy's economy isn't the best, which probably explained the low prices. But even then, the deal was too good, almost like there was a catch. Like anyone would, I read the reviews. They were all positive, especially about the owner, but something felt off, too good to be true. However, the calendar was almost fully booked, showing that people were definitely interested. It was now or never, so I booked it, thinking I could always switch to a hotel if it turned out to be a bad choice. The flight to Italy was my first long one, and it drained me completely. It's strange how sitting for hours can be so tiring, probably the stress of it all. But once I arrived and saw the Airbnb, all that fatigue seemed worth it. The place was stunning, with beautiful floor designs and elegant stairs. They could have charged way more, and people would have still paid for it. But why was it so cheap? I brushed off my concerns, attributing them to my tiredness, and decided to inspect the place more thoroughly the next day. However, my sleep was disturbed by a noise, not quite a scrape, but close. Turning on the light, I saw a cockroach scuttling away. I detest bugs, especially cockroaches. That's when it clicked. The place must have a bug problem they couldn't fix, possibly due to lack of funds for proper treatment, hoping Airbnb would help them afford it. When I asked for a refund, they refused, dismissing my concerns by saying it was normal for the season. It was clear they were minimizing the issue. Determined not to stay another night, I packed my things early in the morning and headed out, planning to find a hotel. Driving toward the harbor, I felt an odd cold sensation in my left ear, worrying it might be an infection from stress and fatigue. With it being early morning, no clinics were open to check my ear. The discomfort worsening, I stopped near the harbor to check my ear with a cotton swab, fearing an infection. But as I inserted the swab, I felt something move inside my ear canal. But when I looked at the cotton swab closely, my heart dropped. There on the tip were two tiny, dark brown legs. My mind raced, trying to deny what I was seeing, but deep down, I knew. The memory of the cockroaches near my bed flashed back. There was a roach moving inside my ear. 
Those two little legs on the cotton swab belonged to a roach, and it was inside my ear, crawling around. Panic set in. For a moment I couldn't accept it, whispering no repeatedly, hoping it was a mistake. But as reality sunk in, panic turned to fear, and I found myself struggling to breathe. After calming myself down a bit, I knew I had to act. I grabbed my tweezers, aiming to remove the intruder myself. The feeling of the tweezers touching the roach, and it moving deeper, is indescribable. It felt like it was trying to dig into my head, though I knew that wasn't possible. Each time I attempted to catch it with the tweezers, it seemed to evade and crawl further in. It became clear I needed professional help. So, off to Patrasis University Hospital I went, all the while feeling the roach moving deeper inside my ear. The journey was agonizing, not physically but mentally, a torture of the worst kind. Arriving early at the emergency room, I was fortunate it wasn't busy. A mother and daughter were ahead of me, but soon it was my turn. The first nurse struggled with English, so we waited for someone who spoke it well. Even when I explained my situation to the next nurse, her disbelief was evident. Though I wasn't in pain, the discomfort and nausea were overwhelming. Her skepticism remained until a doctor examined me. He didn't need to say anything. His reaction confirmed the presence of the cockroach in my ear. Through the nurse translating, the doctor stressed the importance of staying calm. They needed me still for the procedure warning that any movement could cause harm given the delicate tools required. The idea of needing to remain motionless while they worked on my ear hardly eased my nerves, but focusing on my breathing helped me regain some semblance of calm. My blood pressure was high, unsurprisingly due to the stress, but no medication was deemed necessary for it. I didn't understand all the preliminary checks, eager for them to just remove the roach. They decided to use lidocaine, a numbing agent that would also kill the roach, ensuring the procedure wouldn't hurt. The sensation of the roach panicking as the lidocaine took effect was unbearable. Feeling it scramble frantically before slowing and finally stopping was an experience beyond words. It was a relief when the movement ceased, but then came the process of removal. The doctor used curved tweezers, extracting the roach piece by piece, not able to remove it all at once. What they laid out on a napkin afterward looked about an inch long. Considering it had been moving inside my ear, its size was the least of my concerns. They checked my ear one last time to ensure nothing was left behind before sending me on my way with prescriptions for oral and eardropping antibiotics. For the next day, my ear felt numb, a sensation that didn't improve much over the following week. The ordeal of having a roach and surgical tweezers in my ear canal left a lasting impression. After returning to my hometown, the uncomfortable feeling in my ear persisted. So, a week later, I decided to visit my local doctor in Rome to share the nightmare of the cockroach incident in Italy. To ensure everything was okay, she had an assistant clean my ear, thinking maybe some wax was causing the discomfort. My heart dropped when the assistant mentioned seeing something that looked like an insect leg inside my ear. The fear and disgust overwhelmed me, realizing the horror wasn't over yet. During another cleaning, they found six more parts of the roach that the doctors in Italy hadn't noticed. Two weeks had passed since the incident, and realizing not all of the roach had been removed initially filled me with dread. I couldn't hold back tears throughout the procedure. My doctor, who had known me for years, offered comfort and a hug after everything was done. She also suggested seeing a specialist immediately, suspecting more pieces might still be inside. The next day at the specialist's office, I was examined with a microscope. The specialist worked silently until he confirmed my fears. There was still something in my ear. Without any numbing, he used a tool that seemed too big for such a delicate task, occasionally causing pain and the unsettling sound of roach pieces being crunched and extracted. After he was done, despite his assurance that he likely got everything out, I didn't feel the relief I expected. The thought of having roach remnants in my ear for weeks haunted me, fearing an infection might still develop. It's been about a year, and while I've somewhat moved past the trauma, my fear of insects crawling into my ears, especially cockroaches, hasn't fully disappeared. I've improved, but the fear remains a part of me, and I doubt it will ever go away completely. Last month, 
something scary happened to me and my wife. We decided to go away for a short trip over the weekend. We picked out a place to stay from Airbnb, located in a very beautiful area with lots of nature around. This place was far up north, taking us about four hours by car. It was more or less a cabin, sitting on top of a hill, with a big wooden deck that looked out over a wide stretch of land. The surrounding area was filled with forests, hills, and open land. We liked that it was far from other houses, giving us a lot of privacy. Around there you would mostly find just holiday homes or cabins. We drove up early on a Friday and got there around 10 in the morning. At first we were really enjoying ourselves, taking in the peace and quiet of the place. But soon, our peaceful stay turned scary. That evening, while we were watching a movie in the living room, we suddenly heard a knocking sound. I wasn't sure where it was coming from at first, but after we stopped the movie and I stood up to check, it became clear it was from one of the windows. I followed the sound down a hallway towards the noise. As I got closer, the knocking stopped. When I reached the window where the noise had been, I looked outside but saw nothing. Still, I felt uneasy. The cabin was so isolated, surrounded mostly by trees and bushes, making any visitor unusual and suspicious. Returning to the living room, my wife asked if I had found the source of the knocking. Right as I began to explain, a loud banging started at the front door, as if someone was trying to smash it in. I went towards the kitchen to peek through the window and get a better look at the door. But by the time I could see who might be there, the noise had stopped, and there was no one to be seen. We didn't hear anything else for some time, and I hoped it meant whoever was outside had left. But half an hour later, there was a new sound, a man's voice outside, yelling. I couldn't make out the words, or even if he was speaking words at all. We were sure someone was trying to scare us, or wanted to get into the cabin. We kept hearing noises and bangs against the walls, but every time we peeked through the windows, the mysterious visitor vanished. This scary game continued a few more times, making both of us very worried. Going to sleep didn't feel safe anymore. Despite it getting late, I decided to brave the outside to check around. I stepped out and circled the cabin, seeing nothing odd and hearing no sounds. Hoping this meant the stranger had left, I went back inside. We agreed to try and sleep, but promised we'd call the cops if anything else happened. Just as we settled in bed and turned off the lights, there was a loud crash of glass breaking from the other end of the cabin. My wife quickly dialed the police while I locked our bedroom door and started to pack our things. There was no way we could stay any longer with such frightening things happening. Oddly, it became quiet as we awaited the police, who took about 20 minutes to get to our remote location. Luckily, no one tried to break into our bedroom while we waited. The police, once they arrived, showed us to a broken window in the living room, glass scattered all around it. They searched the entire place but found no one. Still feeling unsafe, after the police had gone, my wife and I also left and checked into a hotel. I'm just a regular guy, and I swear this isn't a ghost tale. Our Airbnb was just a normal place, not haunted or anything. And really, I don't even believe in that kind of stuff. But yeah, my girlfriend did check the bathroom when we got there, jokingly hoping the owner might have left something like toothpaste. It sounds dull, but bear with me. We went out to eat in the morning, took a stroll through the small town of Marlow, bought some toothpaste, and then went back to our place. That night, I decided to shower before bed and noticed the toothpaste my girlfriend picked up was the strangest I've ever seen. It looked like it came straight out of an old war movie, complete with a strong, old-timey smell that almost made my eyes water. After my shower, I walked back to where my girlfriend was already half asleep and teased her about choosing such an odd toothpaste. She was too tired to really respond, just mumbling for me to be quiet and go to sleep. I laughed to myself then tried to sleep but something didn't sit right with me. How could she not have noticed she'd chosen such a bizarre toothpaste? And then it dawned on me. She hadn't noticed because she hadn't picked it out. If she didn't, that meant someone else had, and had somehow slipped it into our room. It freaked me out to think someone might have been eavesdropping on us, especially since the bathroom was right next to the entrance of the apartment. I couldn't just ignore it. I had to wake my girlfriend up, even though I knew she wouldn't be happy about it. 
At first, she was annoyed, but when I explained what was going on, she froze, completely terrified. We tried to figure out how someone could have been in our apartment without us noticing. The place was decently sized, the walls were thick, and the landlord lived far away. As far as we knew, no one else had access. After realizing someone had sneaked into our room, my girlfriend and I decided we couldn't stay there any longer. Even though the landlord hadn't shown any clear signs of being a threat, we couldn't shake off the feeling that it was him. Imagine someone listening to every word you say, maybe even watching your every move. There's no innocent reason for someone to do that. The thought alone was enough to decide for us. We had to leave. Packing our things in a rush, we tried to calm our racing hearts. The situation felt like it was straight out of a horror scene, the kind that's too real to be entertaining. Being watched without your knowledge is terrifying. Despite the scare, we were determined not to let this ruin our entire trip. Thankfully, we realized what was happening early enough and managed to escape without any direct harm. The only real downside was having to spend extra money on a hotel. But when I think about it, losing some money is nothing compared to what could have happened if we stayed. That extra hotel cost might have been scary to our wallets, but it was a small price to pay for our safety. A few years ago, my girlfriend Anna and I wanted to escape the noisy city for a while. We thought a short trip would be perfect. So we started looking for a place to stay and found an Airbnb. After searching through many options, we chose a small house on a farm about a two-hour drive from where we lived. This tiny house was near the main house, probably where the farm's owners lived. We exchanged a few emails with the owners after booking. They asked if we'd like some wine or coffee waiting for us when we arrived. They seemed really nice. But then, a few days before we were supposed to go there, they stopped answering our emails. We were a bit worried, but not too much. After all, we had paid, so the house was ours for the week. We thought maybe the owners were just busy and would reply when they could. They had mentioned in an email that the keys would be in a lockbox attached to the small house's porch. They said they'd send us the lockbox code the day before or on the day we arrived, for safety reasons. But then, they just stopped communicating, and we didn't get the code. Feeling a bit upset but still excited about the trip, we decided not to cancel. We had already imagined how peaceful it would be to stay on that farm, away from the city's hustle and bustle. So we took a chance, drove to the farm, planning to get the lockbox code directly from the owners by knocking on their door. Finding the farm was easy, and both the main and guest houses looked great. It was exactly what we had hoped for. When we got to the farm, we noticed something strange right away. The front door of the main house was completely open. Clothes and things from inside the house were scattered all the way to where a car or truck might have been parked before. It was clear to us that something bad had happened. It seemed like the people who lived there had to leave very quickly for some reason. We walked up to the open door, knocked, and called out, Hello? But nobody answered. There was no way to contact the owners because we didn't have their phone numbers. The mess made it look like they had no plans to come back anytime soon. The big questions in our minds were, why did they leave so quickly? And what scared them so much? Anna was very scared and wanted to leave the place right away. We didn't stay long. Although there was no sign of violence like blood or bullet holes, the feeling of danger was very strong. On our way back to the city, we called the police to tell them about the farm, just in case they didn't know what had happened there. Getting our money back from Airbnb was surprisingly easy. They couldn't contact the owners either, and since it was still the day we were supposed to check in, they refunded our money quickly. I often think about what happened to that family. We never got any clear answers, only our refund, which probably means the owners didn't respond to Airbnb either. We've stayed in other Airbnbs since then, and nothing strange has happened. I still think Airbnb is a good choice, but you never really know what you're walking into until you arrive. In the hot summer of 2015, my girlfriend Anna and I decided to take a long road trip. We wanted to see all the famous places in the country, like the huge Grand Canyon and the tall redwoods in Bear State Park, where they filmed parts of a famous space movie. It was supposed to be a fun adventure. Despite a few problems, we learned a lot. The biggest lesson was maybe that hotels are safer than renting places from strangers online. 
While driving through Idaho, we found a small house on an online rental site. It looked good, wasn't too pricey, and seemed to have no close neighbors except for the guy who owned it, living in his own place nearby. The house was pretty outside. Inside, it was simple with just a bedroom, living room, bathroom, and kitchen. Perfect size for us, since we planned to stay just one night. After settling in, Anna and I thought it would be a good idea to save water by showering together. Before that, we put our bags on the bed but didn't really take anything out except the clothes we were going to wear after. We went into the bathroom together and stayed there until we finished. But when we came back to the bedroom, I saw more clothes on the bed than we left. It looked like someone had been searching through our stuff while we were showering. I tried to convince myself that Anna was just looking for something, and I didn't remember it correctly. Feeling hungry, we decided to eat dinner at a local diner, which was quite nice. Unfortunately, that was the last good moment we had that night. After we came back to the rented house, Anna went in first while I got our leftover food from the car. I was just locking the car when I heard Anna scream loudly. I dropped everything and ran inside, finding Anna frozen and pointing towards the bedroom. She told me as soon as she entered the house, she heard a loud noise from the bedroom, like something had slammed shut. Carefully, I peeked into the bedroom, but saw nothing odd. The closet was open, just as we left it, and there was no sign of anyone. I checked under the bed too, but found nothing. I tried to calm Anna down, guessing maybe the noise was from a cabinet closing because of the air pressure change when we opened the door. We managed to settle down and finally got some sleep but I wish I had taken Anna's fear more seriously. In the middle of the night, I woke up needing the bathroom. On my way back to bed, I heard heavy breathing. It wasn't Anna. The sound was coming from the direction of the wall. I crept closer, heart pounding, and when I pressed my ear against the wall, the breathing stopped, replaced by the sound of something moving quickly, and then silence. I rushed to the window and saw a figure running towards the owner's house. I woke Anna up and we immediately called the police, making sure everything was locked and the lights were on. Looking more closely at the wall, I noticed a thin seam hidden behind our nightstand, leading to a small hidden room with a hatch that opened to the back of the house. The police arrived and investigated the secret room. They went to question the owner but couldn't find him. They mentioned that even if the owner had been hiding there, it was his property. So technically, he wasn't breaking the law. Shocked and scared, Anna and I decided to leave immediately for a hotel with available rooms, promising ourselves never to rent from strangers again. This story took place not long ago, just last month. My wife Anna and I decided we needed a short break, a weekend getaway. We found a nice spot on Airbnb, located in a beautiful remote area, far up north from where we lived, about a four-hour drive. It was a cozy cabin perched on a hill, boasting a large deck that offered stunning views of the surrounding lands. The vicinity was mostly covered in forests and hills, a vast expanse of nature. We were drawn to this place mainly because of its isolation. There were hardly any other buildings or homes nearby. It seemed like the area was filled with just holiday cabins and houses, making it a perfect retreat. We set off early on a Friday morning and reached our destination around 10 a.m. The beginning of our stay was wonderful. We spent our time soaking in the peace and the beauty of the place. However, our pleasant experience soon took a dark turn. That same night, as we settled into the living room to watch a movie, an unexpected knocking sound interrupted us. At first, I couldn't pinpoint where the sound was coming from, but after pausing the movie and standing up to listen, it became clear that the noise was coming from one of the windows. I followed the sound down a hallway, trying to trace its origin. As I neared the window, the knocking abruptly ceased. I reached the window and peered outside but saw nothing. The feeling of unease washed over me, knowing the cabin's remote location, surrounded by trees and shrubbery. It struck me as odd and suspicious for anyone to be out here. Returning to the living room, Anna inquired if I had seen anything. As I was about to explain, a loud, aggressive pounding at the front door startled us. It sounded like someone was trying to force their way in. I hurried to the kitchen, hoping to catch a glimpse of the person through the window. But just as I managed to get a view of the front door, the noise stopped, and there was no sign of anyone. After that incident, the rest of the night was quiet, 
but the sense of fear lingered. I thought maybe the person outside had finally left, but half an hour later, we faintly heard a man shouting. I couldn't make out his words. It was unclear if he was actually saying anything understandable. It became obvious to us that someone was trying to scare us, or worse, trying to get into the house. We would hear sounds, like something hitting against the house, but every time we checked, there was no one to be seen. This kept happening, and both Anna and I were growing more worried. With all these strange events, the idea of sleeping seemed impossible. However, as it got later, I decided to brave the outside to check around if we were to get any sleep at all. Stepping out the front door, I circled the house but found nothing unusual. No sounds, no signs of anyone. I hoped this meant the intruder had left, so I went back inside. We agreed to try and sleep, but decided we'd call the police without hesitation if anything else occurred. Just as we settled into bed and turned off the lights, there was the loud crash of glass breaking from another part of the house. Anna quickly dialed the police while I locked our bedroom door and started to pack our belongings. There was no way we could stay under these circumstances. Surprisingly, everything went quiet as we awaited the police's arrival, which took them about 20 minutes due to the secluded location of the cabin. During that time, thankfully, no one attempted to enter our room. Upon their arrival, the police escorted us out, and we saw the broken window in the living room, glass scattered around it. Despite their search, they found no one inside the house, but the feeling of danger didn't leave me. After the police had gone, Anna and I did too, heading straight to a hotel.